welcome back to Macabre London's Abhorrent Advent Calendar. As you'll be aware, if you've already joined me for the past seven episodes, I'm counting down the days until Christmas, but not in the usual joyful way you may expect. Instead, I'll be telling you 24 gruesome stories, until we hit Christmas Day, when you'll receive a full-length episode of Macabre London as your hideous Christmas present from me to you. Under door number seven, we investigated the traditions of burning effigies of the devil in Guatemala and an unlikely sacrificial Christmas goat in Sweden. Today, we're veering away from our regularly scheduled episodes to calm things down a little and to invite you into a chat I recently had with a friend of the show, Malia Molino from Macabre Mondays. Malia is from Seattle, and for the last 13 years she's been working in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. She's an actor, makeup artist, show creator, host, writer and producer. She's executive produced shows with big names like Universal, Fox, Marvel and NBC, and began creating her own content when she was getting discouraged from the lack of auditions. So she started making her own opportunities. Malia first created her show, Macabre Mondays, as an outlet to talk about all the creepy places she was visiting on her days off set, and because of her love of history, she wanted to share the truth behind these locations with an audience spreading the stories far and wide. Amassing a following of creeps, which is how she lovingly refers to her like-minded fans, encouraged her to keep making the show, and so far she's made three spooktacular seasons. After learning about the growing disappearance of historic cemeteries in America, Malia moved on to her next show, Grave Hunter, where she visits historic cemeteries and shares some of the stories of the people buried there in the hopes that people will start giving more care to preserving these hallowed grounds. In 2020 alone, Malia has produced two new shows, History Rants and Horror History, as a result of people picking up on her history-filled Instagram stories and wanting more. Malia and I caught up at the end of November and discussed all things Christmas, what it's like to write history when you're not a historian, and also discussed what I should make from the random booze in the macabre London drinks globe. Malia and I first met back in 2017. It wasn't long after I started the podcast and I was searching for anything with the word macabre in it on Instagram, and there she was, the beacon of joyous infectious energy. I remember watching some of her stories online and her refreshing approach to history was something I was really looking for, and that's where we start off today, discussing how to explain exactly it is what we do. For those of you that have been listening to Macabre London for a while, you may remember hearing and seeing Malia in an episode we released over the summer titled Three Stories of Racial Injustice, where Malia spoke about the hideous and horrifying murder of Emmett Till. The reason I picked Malia for that episode was because she is so passionate about history and people's stories, and I think that really shines through when you listen to her speak, which made her the ideal candidate to give such an important topic the gravitas it deserves. The reason I wanted to catch up and have a chat with Malia and bring her onto the abhorrent advent calendar was to talk about her Christmas event, the 13 Days of Creepmas, where she's running an exciting giveaway and a related history post throughout the 1st to the 13th of December in order to give small businesses a much-needed boost during the pandemic. You still have time to join in with the 13 Days of Creepmas if you want to, and I'll leave all the links below. You may just see a little guest post from me there too. A little bit of a heads up before we get started, this is the first time I've recorded a Zoom call, so obviously things didn't go exactly as planned, and we did have a few little moments where things got stuck, but I promise you it's worth listening to, so do stick with it. I'll be back at the end of the episode to give you a bit more info on where you can keep up with Malia, but without further ado, here's Malia Molino behind door number eight. I feel like originally I was going to make myself like a little mimosa because it's only, you know, nine here, (laughs) but I woke up just about an hour ago and I haven't even eaten yet. And I'm like, "Mm, this could turn sour. Yeah. (laughs) I get a real drunk version of me. (laughs) Drunk history, proper drunk history. (laughs) And I feel like a lot of people, when I try to explain what I do, they're like, they're just very confused. Like there's no, I think in most people's brains, it feels like there's not there's no space for like what you and I kind of do. They're like, so are you a ghost hunter? Like, no, like I've literally been interviewed and I've seen the articles come out and it's like ghost hunter, Malia Molino. And I'm like, I'm not, that's not what I do. I don't, I don't own ghost hunting equipment. That's not, it's, it's not, I I don't feel like it's rocket science. Like, I don't think it's that bizarre what we do. Like we sit around, we talk about history. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, it's so like every time I try and explain to somebody, everyone just kind of they're like, "So you write books?" I'm like, no, I have a podcast and a YouTube show. I'm like, I'm not an actual proper historian, and people think that as soon as you say anything to do with history, they're like, "Oh, you so you must have studied that, and that's your passion." It's like, no, I'm just a hobby st- historian. That's what I like. I'm not like yeah <laughs> into like all of it. It's like I really like it, and it's my passion, but it's not what I do as a as a full time job. And people don't get that juxtaposition of like they really don't. Everything. <laughs> I started calling myself a history enthusiast. Because yeah, like I can't call myself a historian either because I have like respect. Like I actually, I have, I have proper historian friends that have spent years and years in schooling and I'm not trying to steal that title from them. Like I didn't put in those hours. I'm a history enthusiast. <laughs> Please don't call me a historian. It's like calling yourself an archeologist and you never studied it. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly the same thing. But I think what we do is more storytelling than anything else. Yeah. Like I think for me, the history elements of it are interesting and important, but actually it's the stories that I really like gravitate towards. Like if you've got really dry research, it just, it doesn't work as the things that we do. If you're gonna put that into a into an actual study or a book or something. Whereas with what we do, it's more about the people, I think. For me, it's always been trying to breathe life into people that are dead like as you know it sounds kind of weird but I mean I think so many people they don't like when they go through school they don't like history because it's presented so stuffy and boring but when you actually can make a story no matter what time period if you can relate to them as human beings and breathe life back into these names on a page I think that's what engages people like I think for myself I mean as an actor I've always loved storytelling like but this is somewhere along the line i realized i just got more enjoyment out of telling historical stories in a very different way than acting as one um it just felt more rewarding to me and it felt more truthful because there's no creative license like i want to actually tell their story truthfully because i don't know about you like when you watch a historical drama do you ever just like lose your mind and you're like why did you change that like the history is interesting enough. Like you didn't need to add this third party and create a character to make this juicier. Like this was juicy already. Yeah, definitely. I think whenever you watch a dramatization, it's like at the moment I've not been watching The Crown. I don't know if you have been, but there's oh been yeah, all like historians and normal people at the moment over The Crown are like Meah! at each other. <laughs> it's obviously it's a dramatization, so they have to make it interesting. Mm-hmm. So the like sequence of events might not be how they would have been but they put them in a different order to make them more interesting and I can see why that works as a drama but it definitely doesn't work when it comes to history and like I don't know if you've ever had it where I've had people that have been like you didn't get it in the right order and it's like yeah but sometimes it makes slightly a better story if it's not quite in the right order <laughs> and yeah. it's never do that intentionally but sometimes that's just the way that it's been reported because it makes it sound better. That is true. I've never thought about it. I've never had anybody directly say that to me, but I also don't have mine as like beautifully scripted out as your like podcast for so long. Like you're truly telling a story where I'm kind of just, you know, sporadically throwing facts at your face. <laughs> like it's not, it's not always as melodically done as yours. <laughs> Mine's a little discombobbled. But the thing I like about yours is it's quite personable, whereas mine sometimes is a bit sort of like, I don't know, I, I like to keep it quite cold, <laughs> if that makes sense. Whereas like yours is quite kind of joyful and warm, whereas mine's like, mm, welcome to my creepy story. I Interesting. I, I think... I think this is like the cultural difference because I think as Americans, listening to any 
English person tell any story, it innately feels kind of cozy. Like, and it's, it's really like an accent thing. So I think it doesn't come off cold to me because I'm just like, oh, I like listening to her voice and this is nice. Oh, well, that's nice to know. Because <laughs> you never know, do you? When it's your own thing, I find it's quite hard sometimes to sort of see it from an outside perspective. And I, I don't know, like, if you get other people to check over your stories or your like final drafts and stuff uh i do, kind of most times no but there have been a few times like a couple of years ago when i did my big pagan special i actually had a proper crew and that was the first time like i had done my saint francis episode when i filmed a location for the first time i had a cameraman and i had a friend of mine who kind of will like act as like a pseudo director producer sometimes and basically because none of my friends really are into history like so that's the thing for me is i don't really have a community of people here that love history most of my historian loving friends are on the East Coast or overseas. Like I have a lot of friends in the UK that have interests here. It's nobody care, nobody could care. So it's hard to have people I know look over my notes or my script and be like, does this make sense? Because for them, it's just innately boring. Uh, but usually if I have somebody look over, if I'm, they're usually there when I'm filming and I just need them to be like, do I sound like an idiot? Like, should I say that different? Or did I get too animated? No, I, I always get my other half to check over what I've done. Because I'm always a little bit like, is it a bit too dry? Or does it need a bit more kind of like pepping up and stuff? It's like, he's pretty good when it comes to feedback and things. So, and because he's got his band as well, I give him feedback on his music and he gives me feedback on what I do. So that works quite well, I think, because like, I like what he does, but also I don't have a necessarily a vested interest in it. And the same mm -hmm. with me as well, is that he likes what I do, but he doesn't know about it, if that makes any sense. So it's quite good to have that outside feedback. Yeah. Yeah. I will say the I will pick the brain of my man sometimes because he watches YouTube and I don't. Like, I subscribe to very little channels. Like, literally your show is one of the only ones that I watch on YouTube Aww. and so I, I, I it's ridiculous like I and he so he, for him he's more of like the closest thing I can describe him as is like a, a YouTube coach so I just get this like information from him and I just you know try to input that because you know how it is it's like the algorithms are changing or what thumbnails were changed like all these things that i wish i didn't have to think about but we absolutely have to if we want people to see our content so he's very helpful with letting me know like babe you should probably try this because this isn't what's working anymore and i'm like oh great <laughs> thanks <laughs> yeah i think with youtube it's it is hard because it's such a created beast that's the thing with youtube so it's like if you're trying to make something um from the point of view of like not having that handle on youtube it's really hard to make your videos hit that beat so because people get into a rhythm of what youtube videos should be like they're used to snappy editing and you know cut scenes and and multi camera angles and stuff so like as soon as it, you have somebody that is a YouTube person that comes to your video that doesn't know you, and they're like, well, why is this not, this doesn't fit with the platform, so I'm gonna skip to the next video because it doesn't seem mm. like the rest of the platform. So I think you have to be really careful with YouTube to keep hitting those beats over and over again. So it's really good to have somebody that knows the platform. Like I watch so much YouTube, <laughs> that's like the main thing. Do you? Yeah. yeah, we don't have normal TV, we've only got like YouTube and Netflix and Amazon Prime and that's about it. So we don't watch normal TV. So YouTube is something that I've sat and watched for years. <laughs> so as soon as I came around to starting to make YouTube videos, I was like, it has to hit those things, even little things like putting end cards in and stuff. I notice other YouTubers that don't do that. And I'm like, why aren't you doing that? Because it's one of the biggest things that you can do. And it's just knowing the platform, I think, is really integral to making stuff on it. <laughs> so crazy to me. It's, I think, I think I resisted for so long making content that I'm just, 
it's literally just been this gradual over the years thing of me being like, how serious am I taking this? And then when it gets more and more, when I realize more and more that I truly love doing this and I want to do this, like I want to, you know, make my living doing this and not have to keep doing what I've been doing. I'm like, okay, now I need to start paying attention to those things. And I do feel a bit about a disadvantage because I haven't spent years watching YouTube. It just wasn't something I wasn't the kind of person that liked bite size bits of information. I am the person will, that will sit through a three hour, really slow historic drama and be like, <laughs> I love this. Like, I don't want things to end if I enjoy it. Yeah. So YouTube just never felt like the right platform for me, but I've now started watching things. But again, I'm just like, I'm finding the historic doc you know docs that are on there that are like an hour and i'm like this is not what i need to be studying yeah see i find that youtube has really messed with my attention span though like it really has oh <laughs> because you're just watching such short little bite-sized chunks so anything now like we, we suddenly started watching um over lockdown and stuff we got into watching game of thrones and watching oh, yeah more long episode of something I'm like matchsticks in my eyes trying to pay attention and then I'm like so who's oh. this and where have they come from and I'm like this if there's any more than three people I don't know who anyone is <laughs> and there's still characters now and I'm like who, who are they and they came in in like season two <laughs> I have no idea who she they is because my brain doesn't I'm work. the exact opposite <laughs> <laughs> But I, the other day I was um, I was sitting on YouTube late at night, as you do. So this is the problem with it, is that it sucks you in and then you go down little rabbit holes, I think. And um, I was uh, looking up, I've been watching um, a creator at the moment um, who's got ADHD. And so I was like, oh, um, he did a few things with ADHD and then it popped up like another video and it was like, test out and see if you've got ADHD. And I was like, click. <laughs> And so I did that and then I was like, oh, I think I might have mild ADHD. So I feel like maybe it's come from a society of living in like such fast paced, bite sized chunks of info. I think it could be. I'm curious when it comes to like, do you feel like you understand TikTok? So-so mm. to a certain extent. I've had a, um, I did a video on there and it blew up and it got like 3,000 views, which was... That's amazing. Yeah, and then everything I've posted since then has got like 100. So <laughs> bite-sized history I thought would be really cool. Um, and that's why mm -hmm. I'm doing the abhorrent advent calendar. <laughs> nice segue. <laughs> um, yes, no, I want to know all about it. Yeah, because I just wanted to do little bite-sized chunks, but I've had this idea for doing bite-sized history for a while, and I've wanted to do a TikTok series about bite-sized history, but it's so hard to condense everything into a minute, because that's the longest thing I know. You know. Like, how do you feel about TikTok? Have you explored it at all, or...? I, a little bit. I mean, I started when I first put up there was, like, when I would make cocktails for my videos, I would do a TikTok, of how to make the cocktail. So in the video, I'd be like, if you want the recipe to the cocktail I'm drinking, go to my TikTok. And it just, I'm realizing now that it's a completely different platform. And so I have ideas of what I want to do specifically for TikTok that I wouldn't cross to any other platforms because it does move so fast that you, it, like, it, you really have to grab their attention because you're swiping like this and if you don't grab them right away, they're gonna keep swiping, which I think is really strange. And it's also the only platform where I can truthfully see if I pause on the video for like half a second, all I see is other videos like that. Like I paused on one makeup video and literally my entire TikTok is now like beauty. I don't see anything but beauty. And I'm like, oh, that's really, like this is an app that really observes you, which I find fascinating. So for me, because it's, it's a hard platform for me and I feel like I'm still really trying to understand it, everything I put up, I keep trying different things kind of as an experiment. Like, does this work or does this work? Or, you know, should I have a big, you know, words on the thumbnail or should it just be a picture? Like all of those weird things 
it's really fascinating to me to see what has worked and what hasn't worked. And the ones that I put up that I like the most, you know, you get like 10 views or something absurd and you're like, okay, <laughs> guess that didn't work. Yeah, it's so weird. Like, I, I'm sure you've probably had it where you think this is going to be my next biggest video and it's going to get all the hits and you put it out and it goes. Pfft. It's so hard. Like, I have a few of my friends are so brilliant at pumping out content every single day and it has really paid off for them, but it's, it's very different. It's, you know, it's like sketch comedy kind of stuff. So it's fast paced and a lot different, but I just, it takes so much work to produce the content. I think we do because it's, it's not just a fun, like not to degrade any of that. I love that content. And I think it takes a lot of talent, but when you're having to make a video about something historical, there's a lot of research that goes into it. And then when we're one people teams, it's, I can't, I, can't, I have a fantasy of pumping out like two videos a week. Like that for me would feel like an absolute triumph. But even doing my history rant series and the horror history weekly, I found that just to be so exhausting just from having like, you know, two days of research and then filming one day and then a day of editing. And, and it's like, I don't, I'm not complaining. It's just, it's me psyching myself up to do it more often and, and acknowledging how exhausted I know I'm going to be until I get into a real proper groove. Yeah, I completely, completely understand. Like at the moment where I'm sure you're finding this, it's just, it is so full on and it's every single day. And like, usually if I wasn't on furlough, I, I would be doing my full-time job. So at the moment, the only reason I'm able to pump out this much content is because I've not been working, <laughs> so. Do you feel pressure? Like this is, this is it's on topic, but I'm just curious because I know you're on furlough as well. Hmm. Is there, do you feel an extra added a pressure of like, I might not have time like this again. I need to make the most of it and get as much out as possible hundred <laughs> percent yeah because it's yeah this is now when they released the news of the vaccine I was like oh that's so good but also oh no <laughs> that means yeah that start, start ticking away to when we have to go back to doing what we do for day jobs and that's quite terrifying because I've been even though it is really hard work and it like even more full-on than my full-time job I love doing it so much that it's like, this is what I want to do, but also yep. I want to make sure that I've got, I'm 10 steps ahead of where I would be usually so I can start churning out that content again. But it's, it is mm -hmm. hard at the moment. It is really hard. I mean, I think for me, I've, it, it's just been such a strange time of like self realization because you know, I don't, my, my proper day job, so to speak, is all time consuming. It's doing makeup on sets. And so if I'm working, I'm working from 12 to 16 hours and the days that I'm not working, even though it's not my passion, I spend every day I'm not working, looking for my next job. So I never get a break. And when I do have a day, I, I remember last year, I was filming two different things at once. I said yes to two jobs at once. So I was working 18 hours. I would wake up at like three in the morning, go to set on a film and I would leave halfway through to go to my other job. And I was like basically sleeping in my car. Like there's no, I was so tired. There's no room for creative activity. And then there's that cycle of, I'm not doing what I love to do and I'm too tired to do the thing that I do. And this has been going on for, I've been doing makeup for, you know, a better part of 13 years, feeling like a lot of pressure knowing that when, you know, because my life hasn't drastically changed. I'm my career booming in the way that I be right now. So I will eventually have to go back to looking for that work. So I want to make this time count. And I hit a stride like two months ago, where all of a sudden I was so creatively inspired in a way that I hadn't been. And now it's just like trying to play catch up with my brain because there's so much that I want to create because like you, I know my time is ticking down before real life starts back up. And I want to be like, okay. And it's a lot of pressure. And I have to constantly tell myself to relax 
and to not put that pressure on myself. Cause I don't, at least for me, it doesn't help my productivity because I start going to that cycle of like, you're not doing enough. And then I'm just, you know, I've binged 10 hours of the crown. <laughs> like, that's usually I'm kind of feeling anxious, but also not doing anything at the same time. And it's like, I really need to do the thing, but you're not doing the thing. <laughs> and it's just, I hate that feeling. It's horrible. I had it the other day and I just had to go out because I was like, right, this is <sighs> not achieving anything. All I'm doing is just sitting there not doing anything, but my brain's working a million miles an hour and it just takes its proper mental toll. And at the moment, where you are stuck at home, usually you'd have that break up in your day of going out, doing your normal job, and then coming home and then starting to work on something, or I'd work on something before I went to work in the morning, you know, and have those sections of time where it's differentiated between your normal life. Whereas at the moment, it is just constant, like the days are rolling into one another. It it just feels like the lost year. That's what I just keep calling it. It's the lost year because it's just time doesn't matter. And now like LA as of tomorrow, we're going on another stay at home order. So oh, everything's going to be shutting. Ra- yeah. So until December 20th, everything is shutting back down. So, you know, any Christmas shopping, any of the things that I thought, well, at least I can still run out and grab that. It's like, oh, no, I can't. <laughs> no, we, we come out on Wednesday. So Wednesday is our, is our last day. There's just never been a strict enough crack down here or some states have like here in California, it was pretty strict, but you can cross into any other state. So, I mean, the way I keep describing it is we are 50, you know, little countries that are under the guise of calling ourselves one country, but we're not closing any borders down. So it's like, yeah, everybody can do what they want. So, but we've never actually done something where we've stopped it from spreading everywhere. Like, well, if you don't want to be here, go to another state and you could spread it. So it's just where I don't see anything changing. Like, I don't see this lockdown working when other people from other states are still going to be coming in to visit Mm -hmm. from states that don't have mask mandates or never had a lockdown so yeah it's 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 nutty it's nutty like I think a lot of our hospitals are already filled to capacity they've brought the morgue trucks back so it's just great it's cheery it's cheery stuff (laughs) so I want to know from you what what is your how do you think to you how is the media portrayed that the uk is dealing with covid to you guys i want to know just from you like how you how it's been shown to you and then i'll tell you how it's actually going (laughs) yeah i don't okay so it seemed like and this is now months ago like we're talking you know initial lockdown it seemed like you guys, you guys went on a total lockdown and you couldn't leave the country and people couldn't come in. Um, and then I had heard something about the pubs reopening and like encouraging people to go out and like enhance business for places, which seemed so nutty to me. And then it was like, oh, numbers in the UK is arising because here, I think our media is always trying to enhance the numbers other places, not not enhance like they're making it up, but they also want to be like, we're not the only ones that are doing really bad. Here's another country that's now failing. So I think it's been, it hasn't been shown like you guys are nailing it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I'm Because I know, you know, you and I are both obviously obsessed with history. Do you ever find yourself, because all I've constantly been doing is being plagued with this sensation of this would all be an incredible episode a hundred years from now. But I really <laughs> hate, li- like, I keep saying I hate living through history. Like I have, and I don't know if this has changed for you, but there is certain stories that I had had like on my list to talk about that I no longer want to because it almost hits too close to home. And I don't know how to kind of make light or find the lightness in those situations because now living through certain things, it has made so many more historical events human, even more human to me 
that when I read certain things, I'm not like, oh, that'd be a good episode. I'm like, oh my God, those poor people, I can't even imagine. So I think this whole thing has given me another layer of empathy that I don't necessarily think I had before. Yeah, no, I, I think now that when I'm reading things, like I really have wanted to do an episode on the plague for ages and just before the pandemic sort of hit it was um I was just starting to do my research into it and then as soon as that started I was like nope we're not doing that for at least three years now <laughs> yeah I don't want to like I find it fascinating and yeah but I can see how we're sort of fatigued with that kind of story now and i've also tried to keep things light as well and not do like horrific murdery type stuff because i just think it's just not nice at all at the moment and i think if you can avoid it i know obviously you and i did the blm episode but that was completely mm -hmm. different <laughs> and those were important things yeah that was a whole and just the fact that all of that happened in in this like i think and i don't know how it is because I know Bojo or Boris Johnson, I love saying Bojo because I just think it's hilarious. Because to me, I think about him kind of as England's Trump. And I don't know if that's correct in any way or an exaggeration. Yeah, but at I'd least say he he's not as, I don't know, for, for him, he's got the same sort of moral fiber, I would say. He's very much all out for looking after all of his mates in the top position it's amazing to me because I'm just curious what the vibe is because here during the course of all of this we've basically had a civil war and a race war happening and it's been exhausting on a level that I and I think and everybody feels it so I think for me like going back to like the creative inspiration even though I've had all this time I would say for like a good 80% of not being able to work, I've almost been in an emotional coma because it's so much coming at us. And there has been times here, like for example, uh, during election week, everywhere was boarding up. And I remember just driving around being like, I cannot believe that there is so much fear and a real threat of like dangerous action possibly happening that businesses are having to board up because we're electing a president like it was just this eye-opening experience of like this is not the country that I've known my whole life like this is something has changed not changed something's been really brought to a light to the point where people that didn't want to see all of the cracks in our system we're seeing them now and as a person like America to me is this little like baby nation. Like we're just fetuses on the world stage to me. You know, you look at any other kingdom, historical or otherwise, and you're like, yeah, they go through bad leaders. Like we are just living through one of what will be one of our like bad kings. Like we are living through a really bad reign. And this is a really strange thing to witness. And I think it's so interesting because <laughs> people there's a lot of talk here about like a civil war and there's people that are like that could never happen here that can never never happen here and what i think is so strange about that is if you look at any country around the world countries are consistently breaking apart and so for me we have this giant nation of basically 50 countries operating as one kind of it's not unforeseeable that one day 500 years from now we'll look at like oh there used to be a united states of america like i can see it breaking apart and that's not i don't think a doomsday civil war idea i just think it's that's what happens to giant plots of land ruled by one person <laughs> well look at us we're we're different countries and we're in a in a tiny little space so and obviously that <laughs> Wales and Scotland have always sort of been on their own anyway but yeah we, we are different and then you've got Cornwall that is still trying to break away and Cornwall has always really away. yeah yeah they um through this whole pandemic thing they're kind of getting more and more sort of Cornish rights um because in Cornwall the infection rate is very low because obviously there's not that many people living there and the population is is pretty low so the the infection rates they been sort of okay they could have been fine 
all the way through and just sort of, you know, had a few sort of local lockdowns and they would have been all right and done it for a shorter amount of time. But because they've been lumped in with the rest of us, they're now like, ah, screw all of you. <laughs> and I totally oh, understand. Interesting. It. Yeah. But yeah, so it's just that little bit down the bottom is trying to edge away. Are you? Can you tell me about your advent calendar? Yeah, I can. <laughs> um, so I am doing basically an episode. It's called Macabre London's Abhorrent Advent Calendar. And it's an episode every single yeah. day um, from the 1st of December through to the 24th. And then a full length episode of Macabre London on Christmas Day. So it's going to be a scary tale every day. And it's going to be like one little short episode. So they're going to be anything up to sort of about 10 minutes per episode probably more like five to be honest um and it's just going to be saying about uh, the origins of christmas um little folklore tales i've got like a little um folklore tale from the ukraine that i've made up um and yeah various different little stories here and there so it's going to be quite good um and also i'm going to do just a couple of things um about things that have happened in December as well. So there's like one which is a sighting of a UFO that happened in December and they could never work out what it was. So yeah, just oh. things that have happened oh. in the month or things to do with Christmas. <laughs> that is so much work. <laughs> so much work, but so much fun at the same time. And I thought it was time mm -hmm. to actually just kind of bash out a few different episodes because I wanted to do it for a couple of years but never really properly had the time to do it so um I thought actually this year is probably a good year to do it I don't know if I'll make it through <laughs> every single day I hope I do um but yeah we'll see <laughs> I think it's a great goal tell me about creepy Christmas so uh, <laughs> my 13 days of creepmas are it's basically I think for me, just because I have a lot of friends here in LA that have small businesses and I know how everybody's hurting and I wasn't as ad advantageous as you would think I'm going to tell tales each day. Although I did do a few years ago, I did like bedtime Christmas stories, but I only did three of them because that still felt like a lot of work. <laughs> um, but this is basically, it's going to essentially just live on my Instagram, which is new for me and I might do I'm still toying with the idea of doing a proper video to release on my channel about like creepy Christmas something but what the 13 days of creepmas is it goes from December 1st to the 13th and it's almost almost every day I have a giveaway from another small business so a bunch of these really incredible small businesses have donated items to give away and I just want to do whatever little bit I can to encourage people to shop small especially since everybody's going back on lockdown and a lot of these businesses truthfully are not going to make it and even the ones that operate from home you know, their day jobs and what brings them normal money so they can do their side business and, you know, pursue their dreams haven't been happening. So they can't afford to do their, their, their hobby. So I'm just hoping that people participate in the giveaway, because I think, as you know, it's hard to get traction on Instagram sometimes, even when you do things like giveaway stuff. So I'm just really hoping that people participate and people that like don't win will go and shop these businesses. And I also have a couple of fun, like history guest posts, which is the first time, like, I know you're going to be doing one. I have another friend in Vienna that's going to be doing one. And I think that's, I don't know. I think for me, my my feeling of giving this year is just trying to collaborate with people more and trying to bring light to people that I think are awesome that should get more recognition or be seen because we all need to help each other out right now because times are rough. Times are rough. So it's a little bit of a departure, I think, from what I usually do, but I'm still wrapping it in a kind of creepy macabre package. So I'm hoping it stays on brand enough, but... At the end of the day, I just want to help people and give some people some cool free stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this year it's nice to sort of give back to people. Like I was 
researching for my first story and um, it was all about how during the Great Depression um, that was when people started to leave snacks out for Santa um, because it was a nice thing to do to give back to somebody that had given you something so um, kids during the Great Depression their parents encouraged them to leave milk and cookies out for Santa because he was bringing them something so they oh my gosh I know how nice is that <laughs> I had no idea I love that so much yeah, it's good isn't it <laughs> Yeah, there's um It really is. It like makes me feel warm. <laughs> no, there's there's a few things where I've researched so far and like I've not done the full twenty four days so far, but I've done like the cursory research for it. So I've done the first um I've written and recorded the first six, um, and then I'm hoping to do the next few over the next few days and get those edited and ready to go. Um, but yeah, it's been really nice because I've been able to actually understand Christmas a bit more. So that's been mm -hmm. fun, is actually going through and, and realising why we do the things that we do. And I'm sure you found that when you did your Pagan Christmas special. Yes. my and, and mine was a little bit, I mean, it was the ancient origins, really. And I just found myself, I'm I'm consistently irritated about, you know, how much... Christianity has stolen from pagan holidays and it's literally nothing against Christians and I remember I had people that were so worried that I was going to infuriate Christians when I released my special and, and like I even say and it, it's like listen I'm not trying to take away your holiday I'm trying to let people know where your traditions came from because the people that have been persecuted are the pagans and people think about them as evil, you know, and Satanists and all of these things. And it's like, it's not true. Like, you know, that holly bush, that wreath, everything you're using, that's pagan. And it doesn't mean you can't still celebrate the birth of Christ, do whatever you want, but just please acknowledge the people and traditions in which it stemmed from and realize that, you know, it was a political move really to celebrate Christmas when we did, because they didn't want it to be Saturnalia anymore. It's like, okay, we can kill you or we can celebrate this in the name of Christ instead. <laughs> like, it's, 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 you know, do I kind of wish we still had a Lord of Misrule and I don't know, holiday orgies could be fun. I don't know. <laughs> it could be a good time. Very different Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, there's so many things now where I'm like, I research it and I'm like, right, that's another tradition to add to the list of things to do every year. <laughs> I was doing some yeah. uh, some reading about Krampusnacht and um, yes. I'm thinking that next year I'm going to have to definitely go, I think, um, because they hold it in, uh, where is it, Austria? So I was thinking I might have to do a, a trip to Austria and go to Salzburg and go to Krampusnacht next year if things girl work. i will meet you there if <laughs> i can get out of this country it is on my bucket list to go to that yeah. so i will see you there if i'm out of country arrest <laughs> <laughs> no, i've read so many things where it's actually pretty violent and yeah like it's they've had to in 2019 there were so many arrests that they've had to kind of impose a few more rules because the Krampuses were getting a bit out of hand. <laughs> and they were finding them afterwards when all of the officials and stuff had gone. They were finding that they were creeping out afterwards after they've had a few drinks <coughs> and then just going and whipping people in the street. And it's like, no, 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 Krampus, calm down. <laughs> and I, cause I, had a, I had a Krampus come for the Pagan special. Yeah. And he's a part of the only Kramp, there's a Krampus group here in LA and they do a mini run on December 5th. They're not doing it this year because of the lockdown, but they do their own like builds of their costumes. And it was the coolest thing ever. He came in with his basket and his bells and his eyes glowed red. It was so, I was like nerding out so much. I'm like, this is absurd. This is absurd. Like, I love you, Krampus. <laughs> yeah. Literally. Um, yeah, the the, uh, the um, parades online the other day, 
and I uncovered something that I've not seen before. And apparently it's a, it's a tradition in, um, I think it's Austria um, or somewhere like that. One of the Alpine towns anyway. Um, and they have a tradition where all these kids come and hold onto a table in like a, it's like a, um, uh, what do they call the horse rings when like horses dance around in the dressage? It's like a dressage area. And they okay. have people inside this dressage area. So there's sand all over the floor. And then all these kids have to get around the table. And they're all like teenagers, I would say. And they have to hold onto the table. Then they release the Krampus. The Krampus run in. And it is so violent. And they have to drag them away from the table. <laughs> and then the last person left holding the table is the winner. <laughs> and it looks so violent. I'll send you the link. What? <laughs> Yeah, so you can see. It sounds incredible. It's terrifying. I watched it and I was like, no, surely this is not allowed to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'll send you I think my fear of experiencing this is that I'll get mistaken for a child because I'm quite small. <laughs> and I just want them to know I'm, I'm just an observer. <laughs> I'm just here. I am not a participant. <laughs> yeah. Don't attack me. Don't throw me around. But yeah, the, the, it's so funny watching them just all run in at the beginning in their big Krampus suits. And because they're all the traditional Krampus with the big wooden masks instead of like the big scary like latex masks that we have now. So they just look, it looks like an um, where the world thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they're all just running in. <laughs> but it is terrible. I love it. <laughs> Right, should we start wrapping up seeing as we're getting to an hour? If there's anything that you want to talk about or promote, now is your chance. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I mean, I think for me, the, I just hope people actually go to my Instagram and participate in these giveaways because I just really want to spread the awareness of these small businesses. And I really hope they enjoy the guest history posts because that's something I on the line I want to do more of because that's a community I really want to build up so just go to my Instagram for all the weird creep mess it's only 13 days and it's going to get weird there's probably going to be some cocktail recipes too because creep mess that's what I was <laughs> going to do I was going to ask you to make me a cocktail out of all the random booze that I've got here and give me a suggestion as to what I've got <laughs> I've got gin um, and plenty of yes um, I have got Bailey's. Okay. I don't know if you know what Bailey's is. Is Bailey's a thing in America? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Bailey's together, though. That'll curdle. I've got whiskey. I have chocolate orange gin. I have Quantra. Oh. Um, oh. Margarita mix. <laughs> I've got wine. Ooh. Um, okay. I have rum as well, dark rum. And I also have gingerbread rum as well. Gingerbread rum? Yeah. Do you want to see that it? That is next level. I'll get it. Hang yes. On. <laughs> I've got two different Christmas drinks. I have this one, which is the gingerbread rum. Can you see that from there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is it delicious? It's not that gingery. I thought it was going to be more gingery, but it's um, yeah, okay. not particularly. And then I have orange brandy liqueur, which is pretty nice. Oh. Any suggestions? <laughs> See, what What I would do is I would make a mulled wine with your wine and your orange brandy. Ah, oh, good thinking. Yeah, do a hot That wine. would be, because I always add brand, do a hot wine. Yeah, and do it with- So I'd get some orange slices, put some- cinnamon sticks in there, maybe a couple of cloves, and steep that puppy. And how long do you do mulled wine? I've, I've never, I think I've, I've done it in the slow cooker before, which is what you That's do. how I do it. Yeah. I always do it in the slow cooker because I feel like I can have it on low and it doesn't take out as much of the alcohol because if you do it on the stove, you tend to cook off a lot more of the alcohol and I'm not trying to cook off all my alcohol. So I just have it on low, kind of just all day. I just throw in a bottle of wine, throw in some brandy. I add a bunch of oranges, sometimes apple, because why not? Cinnamon mix, clove, and a couple star anise. 
and just let that, oh, and some fresh, oh, this is, this is my little secret to my mold wine. I added some fresh cranberries and a splash of pure cranberry juice. Ooh, I don't know. If it's we, yummy. I don't think I've ever seen fresh cranberries. Ever. <laughs> I don't think we have them. Really? No, I don't think so. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't I think guess it have, is. Unless I'm getting that completely wrong, but I don't think I've ever seen them. I've seen, like, we have cranberry sauce and cranberry juice, but I don't think okay. fresh cranberries. Again, Interesting. Like, yeah. But I don't think I've ever seen fresh ones. I don't think I would even know what a fresh one looked like. Oh, they're like just little red berries. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I feel like I need to Google it now. I, I always have bags in my fridge because I also make a, like, I call it cranberry sauce, but it's really more of a spiced cranberry compote. Mm. And I will make that and I just have a batch of it and I put it in a glass and I add Prosecco on top and I make like a little cocktail with that and it's delish. Ooh, that sounds good. I meant to ask you actually about your ghost and the one that told me about oranges. Do you remember? That was back over. Oh, yeah. yes. And that was so weird. How that is so weird. Yeah. I totally I a, forgot a about that. Thing where it was like, I was looking at a, um, it was like a, a stove top and then um, whatever it was just said oranges. And then there was the stove top and like a black kitchen cupboard. I don't know if you have black kitchen cupboards, but it was a black kitchen cupboard, mm -mm. stove top and it said oranges and it was to do with you. Very weird, because I don't get stuff like that. <laughs> that is so weird. Yeah. I've had a lot of, <laughs> I've had a lot of people essentially exercise my life lately, because apparently, according to a lot of different people, I have a lot of different spirits attached to me. So I just keep getting, I mean, I will literally get random people messaging me kind of stuff like that. And I don't know what that means at all. I mean, I love oranges. I always have oranges in my house. I'm obsessed with them. So that is weird. Hmm. Yeah, it's so strange. I don't know what it was, but it just suddenly popped up. It was just like, oranges, you have to tell Malia. <laughs> it's just really I weird. don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it was. But no, I don't usually get stuff like that. Like I, um, very occasionally do tarot for people and then I'm told that my tarot readings are quite good and quite intuitive so I don't know whether that's something to do with with that maybe could just be a, a leftover thing maybe I should do your tarot for you yes please <laughs> we can save that for another episode <laughs> all right I'm count me in I'm down thank you very much for coming on the show and for talking to me yes. today. It has been absolutely delightful to catch up and I hope that we get to see each other again next year, hopefully, if everything is all sorted and back to normal. Um, is there anything you want to yes. say before we wrap up? I mean, I'm just so happy to get to chat with you. This has been so lovely and I miss traveling so much and I had so hoped to make it back to the UK this year and actually get to hang out in person again, so. This has brightened the beginning of my holiday spirit to be able to chat creepy, fun things with you. So thank you for having me on. Yay! Thank you for joining me for door number eight of the Macabre London Abhorrent Advent Calendar. I hope you enjoyed mine and Malia's chat. If you enjoyed that, then do please let me know. And if you'd like me to chat with other people in the spooky history realm and you have any suggestions of anyone you'd like to see me have on the show, then do let me know. Make sure you check out Malia's Instagram for her 13 days of Creepness giveaways. You have just enough time to still join in, so make sure you do, as you could grab yourself some lovely goodies, just like I did the other day when I won something, which is amazing. Also, be sure to check out her YouTube channel, where you can find all of her episodes of everything she's made, so there's plenty there to keep you going. And do let her know that I sent you. Please like, comment, rate, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you're enjoying this on, and come and say hi on my social media. If you'd like to help support the show, then you can do so by signing up to my Patreon, buying a gift from the Amazon wishlist, or making a one-off donation via the ACAR supporter link. The links for all of these are in the show notes and description. Thank you for joining me. 
I've been Nikki Juice, and I'll see you for door number nine tomorrow.